Hello, good morning, Taylor. Good morning. Or afternoon, or you? Yeah, it's it's afternoon. The Central European What's time. That? Central. So your afternoon. Yep. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So good afternoon. Thank you. How's the rest of the day looking for me? <laughs> As the world spins around. Good morning, Bill. Still morning for you, right? You're in US time zones this week. Let's see. We'll get started about five after. Get everyone time to come in. Chat participants. Need notes. Dropped into Zoom. Hello, we'll get started at about five after. <clears throat> Meeting notes are in the Zoom chat. You can add your name and any topic you would like. Hello. Greetings. Greetings. Hi, everyone. Hey, Tal. Has anyone been following the uh, executive order and all the things coming out of that in regards to zero trust and uh, software uh, supply chain protection? I have no idea what you're talking about. Ooh, fun topic. In, uh, in short, uh, the federal government is looking, uh, the US federal government specifically is uh, looking to start including things around software bill of material. So basically saying not only where does the software come from, but looking at all of its dependencies as well and ensuring that uh, that they're able to work out the source of this of this stuff, and they're also looking at applying zero trust architecture as a as a mandate uh, with with future uh, with current and future contracts that connect in with either the federal government or the military itself. So 
uh, causing a huge amount of movement throughout the uh, throughout the U.S. government, and uh, they were moving the, towards this direction anyway. But the colonial pipeline was the trigger that caused them to move. So um, it may be worth talking about at a later time when things start to settle about what uh, what they actually mean with that, because right now. They're, they're doing comments through both NTIA, NIST, and similar, and they're gonna put out more guidance as to, as to what the stuff means. So uh, very likely it'll affect things that go through here that is, that's on the United States side base. And what tends to happen is uh, if this stuff ends up shifting into best practices, then it's likely that other countries will pick it up, even if they don't write wording, uh, simply because as the industry moves and best practices shift, then um, reducing your total risk, both from a technical and compliance perspective, uh, you, you wanna make sure that you're following best practices over, over time. So my guess is we'll see other countries adopt, even if they don't explicitly uh, put it into their wording, similar uh, similar defense techniques. Wow. Uh, in a nutshell, that, that's what's going on right now. Well, you know, uh, auditing software <laughs> as happens Could already. Could we add this to the, um, we're jumping right in, and it sounds like you're saying it's, it seems interesting for everybody. Can we just put this as a topic? We, we, we could. And do you we, we, have we a could. link, and, and, Frederick? I, I can I can find some some links towards it. Uh, that, that'll that'll be fine. All right. Well, see if I can pull some slides because we spoke about it in the in the Linux Foundation Public Health uh, last week. So maybe if I can pull their slides, then maybe we maybe we can use that as a jumping point. So. Let me let me go work that out. Okay, I'll bump it down um, a little further. It sounds interesting. I just want to make sure everyone can join in. All right. Tal. Um, if you want to add to the discussion topic, the um, I dropped a spot at the very end for Frederick to add the links. And if you were, I think you had a comment, if you could put it in there and save it for the discussion. So you don't forget, because yep. there's a few others for you. So by the time we get around. All right. Um, the meeting notes link is in the Zoom chat. You can add your name. Does anyone have and any topics? Does anyone have any walk-in items that they haven't added yet? Sure. All right. Can everyone see? Meeting notes? Yep, I can see. Okay, great. All right. Um, so merges last week were mainly grammar linting type things, interested party updates. Um, we had a few things that we didn't get to. Tal had asked about KubeCon experiences. We're now going a little further out, but if there's anything that people want to add um, or mention, like talks that folks should go check out, I think the the KubeCon videos have been posted. So, and. I put this at the top because that was there last week and we hadn't got to some of the use cases again. Uh, last week, I think we got the CNF definitions took up a lot of time. 
Uh, Simon, did you want to talk to this this week about the stateful CNFs use case? Yes, I'd like to. Yeah. All right. Um, I have the stuff up, but I'm happy to just hand over um, control and you can run through. I think you had some diagrams and stuff. Yeah, I had, so I'll share my screen. All right, um, go ahead. So, if I could use it to see the diagram from my uh, screen. So, um, so this is a use case related to uh, 5G CCS, um, where a CCS is a convergent charging system. And um, it's a network function that needs to maintain state. And so we're trying to, so me and Olivier are trying to uh, define a use case uh, around that. Um, so this diagram that you can see on the screen is um, a basic use case for how a user with a device interacts with the convergent charging system. And the element within the CCS that needs to manage state is this uh, block here, which is the account balance management function. So um, I just, just whiz back to the various different things that are involved in here. So I filled in a glossary um, of all the different things that are involved with um, CCS, a lot of um, terms, um, acronyms and that kind of thing that may not be familiar with uh, various people on this call. Um, the, the types of state that we're dealing with here are um, long-lived state that relates to uh, balances, subscribers, devices, um, quotas, price plan. And we have uh, also short-lived state that relates to the session and the session data. Um, I'm just going to skip through um, the initial sections and just talk through this particular use case here. So um, the precondition here is that we have a, a user, this little uh, stick man here, um, and they have a device and they're registered with the service. So they are allowed to use the network. Um, and the, the initial step is that the device uh, requests, um, well, the device subscription, um, make the real-time request to the network for quota to use uh, the network and it starts a charging session. Uh, network routes the request um, from the user equipment through the AMF, which is the access mobility function, um, and either to the PCF or the SMF. So in the initial case, it's going to the SMF, which is the session management function to the CHF, which is the charging function. And that communicates internally inside the CCS to um, identify whether the subscriber exists. And um, then it runs some rating rules um, that result in a charging session being granted. And that's returned through to the user equipment. Um, when the um, charging session um, with, a, with its quota uh, expires. Um, so um, when a charging session is granted, it's given a certain amount of time to, to run for um, or a certain amount of uh, usage, um, such as a data um, allocation. One that has expired and, and run out, the device requests for more, uh, more quota from the network and a sec subsequent request is sent through. The end of the usage scenario, the device completes the session and uh, finishes everything off and sends the final charging request through to the CCS, uh, which calculates the total charge and generates events. The events are used to fill in the details of your monthly bill if you're a monthly subscriber or to um, they're sent through to uh, charging systems to actually account for um, how much data you've used. So I'm going to talk about why the CCS needs to maintain state. So 
uh, 5G real-time convergent charging system has got to maintain account balances and uses quotas for all active subscribers or all active subscriptions, I should say. Um, TCS needs to accurately reflect uh, the balance of a subscription across the account's lifetime. State needs to be preserved um, in the event of any catastrophic failure. And the state should be available across a whole cluster of all stateless CNFs that need to access it. So in this scenario, the SMF needs to access the state at any point to determine whether the subscription is active and the device is valid. So one of the properties of uh, a convergent charging system is that it needs to have low, low latency. So low latency, and we're talking ultra low latency, where um, less than a millisecond end-to-end -end response time is um, necessary, or less than certainly less than uh, 10 milliseconds in the extreme case. Um, we need to allow devices to use the network um, with a very short amount of time to make that decision. The uh, service provider needs to respond quickly to allow customers to use the network and um, that's their expectation. Um, they wouldn't expect it to take a number of seconds to get the grant to uh, allow them to use the network. And if the service provider isn't able to make a decision, then the, they might lose money by um, the subscribers going elsewhere, for example. Um, and um, when the charging system makes uh, charging decisions based on the stateful data, um, it then informs other decisions. So the decisions go through to the policy charging function, to the PCF in this case, and that um, informs the device to control their um, uh, speed that they're allowed to re retrieve uh, data on the network and other properties. Um, yeah, the service provider needs to maintain the balances and quotas for millions of devices potentially in their network. Um, and many of those devices will access that information concurrently. So you can imagine a lot of subscribers looking for um, downloading data in a um, small period of time. So the state we're talking about here, um, it should be, uh, should have um, ACID compliant properties. Um, and these are things like, uh, it needs to be atomic, needs to be consistent, needs to have isolation and it needs to be durable. So a lot of these are um, properties of a database and that's effectively what a convergent charging system is. And the convergent charging system should be resilient and scalable. So um, it should, it, the stateful CNF is, is uh, how we're talking about the convergent charging system and it should um, continue to follow cloud native principles. So if you have a node failure, it shouldn't result in any service outage. So you need to have uh, clusters of uh, systems to uh, allow for that. You should also do, be able to deal with um, spikes in service usage um, by being able to automatically scale up and then scale down after the spike has completed. And um, a stateful CNF is a software system and so software systems need to be upgradable like um, any CNF. And the stateful CNF um, should also be portable across um, different hosts and clusters. So um, the system shouldn't be tied to a single node uh, because you might need to take that node out of a cluster, um, but you should be able to use things like taints and tolerations to uh, control which nodes are used for the CCS. And 
you should be able to make specific resource requests such as how much memory you need for an, the in-memory database, how much CPU percentage you need, and uh, how fast the persistent volumes are that you have that uh, you use to back up your system. So you use the resource requirements that Kubernetes gives you, and you also configure affinity rules so that you don't have too many parts of the stateful CNF in the same place. So the challenges of running in a Kubernetes environment are that you can't, um, so in a non-Kubernetes environment, so like a, a bare metal, uh, so a PNF or a BNF kind of situation, you, you're basically running with a specific set of uh, machines that you have uh, pre-provisioned. In a Kubernetes environment, you don't get that control. You just have to request the resources and um, hope that the system, Kubernetes system, gives you those um, nodes that you need. Um, for the convergent charging system to be able to respond in um, ultra low latency situations, all the data needs to be held in memory. Um, and because of that, you need to um, you, you find it hard to move the workloads from one node to another because of the um, in-memory data. You need to um, be able to move it to other nodes in the cluster if you want to drain a particular node for uh, maintenance reasons. And um, in this example diagram here, you can see that there's um, multiple clusters involved. And within each cluster, there's multiple replicas of each. Um, particular process that's involved in the convergent charging system. So in the case of um, node failure, then um, you need to make sure that um, the state is maintained across all nodes that may interact with the charging sessions. And um, in the case of node failure, you need to be able to bring up uh, replacement nodes and fail the um, processing of the requests over to the standby cluster if necessary. But just because we're um, storing the state in memory for speed reasons, there's no reason why you shouldn't have um, permanent backups of that. And so you need to have persistent storage and um, high speed persistent storage to handle uh, things like checkpoints and um, snapshots of the data. And that data is also replicated uh, across different availability zones in the case of a Kubernetes um, multi cluster system, so that you have geographic redundancy of the processing and of the data. So the Conclusion is that um, although a stateful CNF does um, exhibit different um, requirements um, on a Kubernetes system, it should still follow the cloud native principles that we've listed here. So it should be scalable, it should be resilient, and it should be portable. So that's all I've got to say on this. Uh, until anybody has any questions. So, yeah, all of this side regarding the stateful CNF, are we deploying it through the stateful uh, controller or what we call stateful set in, in Kubernetes? objects so yes okay and that has certain limitations i mean the known listed limitations already so how we or how you are addressing those limitations especially when it comes to resiliency i mean during the pod termination or like you said about node failure cases um, do you have certain workarounds by yourself to mitigate such 
scenarios or yes yeah, so um one of the recommendations in kubernetes is that if you have complex workloads you need to have uh, a kubernetes operator um so that's what we have done um in our company we've created a kubernetes operator to maintain the stateful set so kubernetes itself manages the the pods that are running in that stateful set but um higher level um information about the relationship between the stateful set um pods and the the management of how they should be brought up or brought down is managed through the kubernetes operator infrastructure through uh, having a manager and a controller okay um, I have one regarding uh, the this picture, actually two clusters. So these are two uh, sites and then two separate Kubernetes clusters uh, where the CCS is running. Yes, that's okay. right. So um, the way that we structure it is that you have um, geographic redundancy of um, pods. Um, within a cluster, and then you have geographic redundancy of clusters mm -hmm. as well. And the state uh, state between uh, these two sites, do you expect that this state is uh, synchronously replicated? Yes. Yeah, so any changes okay. that are made to the state on the active cluster are immediately replicated to the standby cluster. Um, uh, do you expect that to, to happen on the on the storage uh, level, let's say whatever it is, uh, or you are making sure with the CHF uh, function to transport all the changes atomically to both environments? Um, it's done through, um, not directly through the CHF, but um, through backend um, replication. So um, it, it's not done through um, state-based replication. So um, when I, when I think about um, like state-based replication, it's like whenever you write to a database, you write a transaction um, across the network to the, the secondary database effectively. So we're, we're mm -hmm. doing it through, um, whenever you make a change to data, um, that same change is applied through um, a mechanism um, that um, is, before it's written to the database, uh, it sort of effectively replays the transaction um, on the standby cluster, if that makes sense. And uh, when you are, um, say, onboarding that on the existing environment or existing platform, uh, is it something, this replication, something do, that you realize on, on top of Kubernetes? Yes. Or you, you require, uh -huh, okay. Yeah, so we so it's just uh, it needs um, a high speed network connection between the two mm -hmm. um, two sites effectively, um, but yeah, it's it's done on top of uh, over the top of Kubernetes. I mean, what we do, I was asking just to, to check uh, how it fits uh, with uh, with approach in similar cases, not uh, to the charging function, but uh, in similar data intensive applications. Um, we are essentially having a storage class um, on a okay. ultra yeah. high speed uh, all flash storage, which is uh, next to the uh, Kubernetes infrastructure. So there yeah. is like uh, 100 uh, gig uh, iSCSI uh, connection from, from the nodes. Yeah. And then uh, these storage systems usually also come with some synchronous replication. So you would, uh, uh, we would replicate the volumes or we are replicating the volumes on that uh, storage system synchronously uh, to another site. Uh, of course, the synchronous replication has a performance penalty. The better one for performance is asynchronous, but it's always a question what is your, your uh, uh, recovery time objective and recovery point objective. Uh, when you look at this, but this is what worked for us. Uh, so yeah. we skipped uh, any attempts to to keep the state state inside the cluster, and yeah. we yeah. Uh, moved the it's state into awesome. the all flesh uh, ultra high performance storage. Yeah, I mean we of cluster. we 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 do use the um, flash storage um, locally for um, you know this this 
this state here it is stored in a high performance system, uh, you know, SSDs effectively that are co-located with the with the nodes, but they're you know they're shared shared storage um, between all of the processes that are involved in this particular cluster, for example. Um, but and they're used for the cold start scenarios. Um, and um, the, the data that is stored in here is then archived off um, onto um, not so fast storage um, because obviously there's a limited amount of space you can store in, in the sort of the, the local, effectively local storage. Um, you need to archive it off into other storage. But yeah, it, it is, I guess there's two ways of solving the same problem and using a storage class is one way, especially if the um, storage system gives you the, the replication um, for free effectively uh, by using uh, the, the storage class that has that capability. Whereas we do it, um, I guess, over the top um, before it gets to the point where it's writing the state for the data, for the uh, SSD. But in that question, uh, in that case, question is uh, um, if you have a performant enough uh, storage uh, for a persistent storage uh, volumes, um, do you need to hold everything then in memory? Yes. Yeah. Everything is held in memory. Yeah. I, I, uh, this is Rani. I'd like to expand Vuk's question or remarks. I, I think there's a, it's a very good analysis, but when you said that there is a strict requirement to keep everything in memory, it's, it kind of sounds to me like it's a solution and not the problem definition. Um, so I, I like Vuk's questions about what is the objective recovery time and uh, target response time. I think we should stick to that. And then maybe for the best practices, pick the technology that can uh, fulfill these requirements. So there are things like uh, Redis database, which in itself is in memory, but it acts like a database that can be accessed through API. So maybe something like that can uh, can be a solution here, but we need to better understand these requirements to see if a Redis can, can be the right solution here. Yeah, I mean, in this use case, we're, we're trying not to be too specific about our implementation and also not be too specific about um, you know any um, implementation that you may want to do to, to to create this system. So we're just trying to be sort of generic from the sort of CNF um, perspective and and trying to sort of um, describe these kind of properties that you need when you have a, a stateful CNF. Yeah, and I think you did a great job throughout this uh, document. But the the fact that you mentioned the in memory is kind of to me a bit mixing. Uh, or, or forcing a specific solution and, and not leaving it open. So I, I would rather not, not have the, the specific reference to in memory here, but rather some performance requirements or response time yeah. requirement. Yeah, which is, which is what we've described um, in somewhere in here where we talk about um, ultra low latency, um, where we need to have maintained that low response time um, and high throughput. Um, and if you, yeah, what, however you implement it, you still need to maintain those properties. And um, generally the implementation falls to using um, local caches or, you know, a, or an in-memory system like Redis, for example, or, or other NoSQL databases um, that, that can handle that kind of situation. Yeah, that makes sense. We, we just need to keep the requirements and the uh, solution separate. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, uh, uh, yeah, we, yeah, I, I agree, I agree. Um, and we've, I've tried to do that in by writing this, by trying to keep it generic. Simon, it m might be in that the section challenges and limitations in the um, second and third paragraph. Yep, you're right there. Yeah. So where the short-lived state for a stateful CNF is stored in memory, and then the next one where long-lived state is held in memory. So I, I guess it would be working backwards to why would we 
the question is why why would we choose memory at all so then whatever the requirements are have those written out and they may actually be somewhere else in this um okay further yeah, at they, yeah, but they just are, they are either we yeah. yeah just to make sure that's highlighted and then maybe um if it, if you reference it one way or the other then it'll be more apparent okay yeah i can do that so explicit requirements about um yeah i don't even know if it has to be in this use case i'm um, running um but the, i like the idea of of pulling those out somewhere um could could you add some of that to the discussion uh, that's linked from the PR and then maybe we can talk more if, if there's not a specific area that you were thinking yeah, this, in the this PR. Discussion. 167. Yeah. Yeah, if you could, uh, yeah, um, is it Ravi who is commenting? Sorry, I didn't actually. Have I that. think it was um, Ron Ronnie. Ronnie. Ronnie, okay. Ronnie. Sorry, yeah, if you could yeah, add the, um, the, the comments you made um, to the discussion just so I have a, a point of reference and then I can respond to those directly uh, when I update the use case and and also to, to you books because who you were um, making other comments weren't you about um, implementation details so uh, again any you know any comments um, feedback um, yeah please add to the discussion then I can uh, follow up and directly yeah sure I will sure. I will visit the, the PR um, but this was a helpful uh, walkthrough definitely okay we have uh, some uh, other questions, but I will ask them in a, in a PR we can discuss there. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Taylor. All right. Does anyone else have any comments or questions for Simon? All right, the next one that we had in here was um, a 5G RAN use case. And let's see. I don't know if we have <clears throat> everyone on the call. For, um, let's see. Ashish Sharma. I'm not seeing them in the list. All right, let me just bring it up anyways. Uh, Zoom is not finding the window, sorry y'all. Um, let me try that again. There we go. All right. So this one's um, pretty extensive and there's been a lot of comments and it seems like the latency comments that uh, on the last one, Simon, there'd be some <clears throat> related things for this dealing with latency. Yeah. Um, I don't wanna go through all this myself. I'm hoping that someone, the person that wrote it could join, but They've added a lot on the um, glossary and other things. And I think Frederick and Simon, you have both commented and Victor. There's some references that are around 3GPP and 5G. Um, I've particularly appreciate Simon and Oliver, the way the Trello have approached um, the CCS and <clears throat> what y'all are doing to, 
to break away from terms that may be expected. And you may have references to existing stuff because it's going to use those tunnels and everything for integration. But you've put it in um, words and adding requirements that make it easier to map to other things. Um, so if Frederick has gone through this, but I'd, I would just say if everyone could take a look at this one and I know it's going to be a relevant use case. Um, does anyone have any comments on this or I can hand it over if someone actually wants to walk through it. Um, Ian, you had some comments, Frederick, or Victor, or Simon, whoever. Uh, I need to give this a more thorough going along, I think, than, than I have yet. So I don't assume I've done. <laughs> yeah, my comments are mostly around formatting. Uh, I, mm -hmm. Maybe it's a question for just the um, syntax checker just checks for basic syntax errors, whereas, uh, you know, there's, there's no, um, no checking for whether the markdown actually renders correctly. Um, so I don't know whether there's anything mm. that can be added to the checker to validate things like the, you know, the, the bulleted list and things like that. I mean, I haven't, I don't fully understand the RAND terminology, so I can't comment on the, the content too much, although I, I could follow along based on my networking um, experience, but um, yeah, that's all. Quite honestly, if you can't follow along on the RAND te terminology, then we should do a better job explaining it as well, because this has to, um, has to work a, for others. There's, there's a lot of acronyms that are used interchangeably, and the, and the, the second use case doesn't fully explain what the, all the terms are. Uh, <laughs> the, the, there is no surprise. It is like learning another language dealing with RAND, but you don't necessarily have to know the whole of RAND. To, in fact, you shouldn't have to know the whole of RAND to understand the use case, I think. I mean... It's, uh, I don't have to understand every application anyone might reasonably conceive of to understand how to build an operating system. And I think that's how this should work for us as well. Yeah. Um, I have a, a general question. I, I wonder if we want this aligned with ORAN or would we prefer ORAN to be a separate use case? Um, ORAN adds disaggregation and other uh, terminology. Um, I, I don't know if it could be like a supplement to, to this use case or if this could be written from the ORAN perspective. What do you think? I'd say it, if, it's, if it's different, then um, create a new one. And we really want use cases um, like with what um, Vuk and <coughs> Ronnie were trying to say as far as feedback to Simon. Simon's done a great job on trying to break the requirements up, but we want to keep going that way. So around the memory um, usage, why are we doing it so that we can think about other things? So on the ORAN, it would be here's where we're going, but that's a implementation. So what are we learning out of that? But it sounds like it would be a, a new use case. If you're saying um, ORAN solves something, then what is the use case that it's solving and how does that tie in, Tal? Yeah, I, I guess it could refer to this use case um, just to not repeat things. Um, oh, absolutely. I guess also I think a diagram, I mean, I add a couple of diagrams to, to my use case and I think the diagram really helps to understand um, things where it's using a lot of terminology that, um, and maybe this one already has one. I... Yeah, I was checking because we don't, um, it doesn't show in the PR, unfortunately, if no. you've embedded. I uh, don't see any. Maybe when you go and look at some of these older ones. Of course, this is a... Um, an implementation, but that's fine. We work our way backwards.
one of the other concerns as well on that particular thing was um, what is there anything in terms of the Kubernetes uh, architecture itself that is lacking that, uh, or in the Linux architecture with the way containers work that is lacking that uh, that are not sufficient for the for the time requirements and. So I, I, I don't have an answer to this just yet, but it's, it's something that's sitting on my mind based on some of these conversations. Is that I, I, a very... I, I've been looking at this quite in depth and I don't have an answer to this right now. I think um, when it comes to things like PTP, its job is to get you a really, really accurate idea of what the network time is, the network clock says. Um, and that's well and good. And it requires a certain element of hardware support to figure out um what the network is telling you about that clock but then there's another part of that which is the software interface the thing where you actually ask for the clock um and obviously that introduces latency as well so when you say i'm getting you accurate time then how many of those components matter and how accurate do they all need to be exactly and, and there's a lot of unknowns there um yeah if, In, and again if, I, i'm doing this myself for a day job right now and i can't tell you the answer to that so it feels to me like you know it, there's a lot more unknown than you think it's like you ask an expert and they probably wouldn't be able to give you a straight answer um i don't know whether uh, it makes me feel better or worse though <laughs> at least oram does does define these limits and um i mean that's part of what it's trying to do to, to create these definitions e Probably doesn't. It <laughs> probably tells you how accurate the clock gets over the network. But then if I'm making a system call to find out what that clock says, and that system call takes 15 milliseconds, I put money that no one thought to write down that that shouldn't happen. Well, I, you know, the synchronization work group is very complicated. But anyway, I, I will point out that some of these issues and how they relate to Kubernetes are having, say, the host running a, a real-time kernel, a Linux kernel. So yeah, I, I, hate it. I hate it when people say that as well, because um, I, I've spent a lot of time with that in the past as well. And it's not a matter of what kernel I'm running. It's a matter of what it delivers me. Uh, real time right. kernels don't deliver you real time behavior for one. They, they well, have quite well, specific these limitations. Are weird. <laughs> I mean, in, in Oran, we have something called the, no, the non real time RIC or. Yeah, it, 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 it gets fair. Of course, these are a matter of definitions, and the, the term real time itself is probably should never be used. <laughs> um, well, it never used unqualified. I, I'm not upset with people using it, but they have to be spell it out because it means different things to, well, there are different levels of real time. So it's all about the speed of light. Yeah. So, so, so to, uh, the, specifically about real time kernels in Kubernetes, can you request that? Um, you no. want to run on a node with a real-time kernel so there isn't a requirement that allows you no. to do that and if you did what would it mean because it's well, not about I, your, you, 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 I, I struggle to explain this one to people who talk about real-time kernels but the question you actually want to answer is can i run on a host that gives me for instance a bounded response to system calls they return in a simple a certain quantity of time that would right. be useful for a real-time application. It's also a guarantee that Linux doesn't offer with or without the real-time kernel. Um, but there's a whole bunch of bounds like that that are a lot more relevant to you than the piece of software that's used to implement it. Yeah. So I guess specifying um, a, a, a set of requirements for the host system may imply that it will give you a decent performance. So like a... Yeah. You know, high high percentage of CPU, lots of memory, those kind of things will potentially give you a system that will satisfy your base requirements, even if you can't um, request those specific uh, like real time kernel kind of parameters. Yeah, I, I think the way I would phrase it is at the moment you see people saying I want a real time kernel, which amounts to I don't know what aspects of a real time kernel are making my software work. But at least if I run it on a real-time kernel, I haven't managed to break it yet. Versus uh, saying, if you do a certain thing in a certain quantity of time, then my software will definitely work. And if you don't, it will probably fail. Um, so one of those is based on constraining the actual software you use, at which point we start getting down to you know, Linux 4.x 
with certain sets of patches and so on and nothing else will do and oh there's a security bug well that would break compatibility so you're not allowed to fix it and so on and so forth yeah. so constraining software is a bad idea but constraining behavior is a perfectly fine idea but it's actually really hard because you don't know what behavior is necessarily or what what you're relying upon yeah okay. well I, it, it might be obvious but the life cycle of ran uh, ran is a very uh, is a use case that <laughs> Well, we have a lot of these use cases, but uh, RAN is one where you're building, you're specking out the hardware, you're specking out the software very, very, very carefully for all of this. So um, mm. I don't know if a generic yeah. solution, <laughs> right? The life cycle begins when you install the cluster in the first place with all the CNI solutions. I mean, we're going back to, to the things that are what this work group is about, right? There's, it's not just CNFs. It's also the platform itself needs to be designed in a certain way. And by that, we mean not just the software platform, but also the hardware platform. So, um, Yeah, if you are going to run a CNF, then what services are you going to have to offer it is, I think, kind of key to making this a success. It's not just about saying, if you're going to run a CNF, then the CNF has to be designed with these things, you know, these beautiful um, procedures in place. We're not, we're not, we're not talking about the, the joys of, um, how the how the CNF developers think as much uh, exclusively. Um, we also need to know what Kubernetes has to provide, what they can expect. Yeah, and a, a large part of uh, of the real time Linux effort is actually focused around getting rid of spin locks uh, within the kernel and yep. and making those preemptible. Uh, yep. It doesn't mean that you're going to get uh, the time that you expect, uh, but the fact that the kernel is preemptible means that you're you're more likely to get the time that you that you expect. So, uh, but it's yeah. the, the the question. I th I think there's two parts to this because one is how does the software expect to interact? Like if if it's just a if it's something I can drop in with a device bug in and call it a day, then I we're in good we may be in good shape. But if it's something that uh, has to go through the through the kernel, then uh, what what are the I know that there's work there to to make uh, clock more predictable or, or get to to make the clock system calls more predictable, and that they ha that some there are some paths there. Um, it may in, I, and in the normal course of things, I would not be too concerned. But I, I am concerned that when we run it through a kernel, when we run it in a namespace, we run it through something that's Kubernetes based. When we get scheduling, do we need numa alignment for for that thing? Like I, I, I get a little worried there for, well, uh, well, for, so for that reason. Well, one of the most important things of the real-time kernel, uh, and I believe actually Canonical have passed judgment on this in the past, and it's quite significant, is you can run a process with the FIFO scheduler, which is effectively uninterruptible. If it's got work to do, it wins the argument when scheduling comes up. In fact, scheduling won't happen because it's already won the argument. So anything else begging a bit of that CPU is going to lose. Um, so, and if you do that, if you run that, then you make the platform incredibly fragile because, you know, if it feels, never feels the need to give the CPU up, then, then nothing else can run, uh, which is obviously not a great way of designing a platform, um, especially when the platform processes are the ones that are going to suffer along with everything else. So, you know, there are certain elements of this that are, you know, can be quite stability endangering, shall we say. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of this is not about, for instance, if you steal time from me, if something else schedules, how long before I get the kernel back? Firstly, that is still not a hard guarantee. The real-time kernel says, I will try and give it back to you very soon. Um, and when you consider how it's been tested, it's been tested for high-performance high audio. So, you know, 40-ish kilohertz, 80 kilohertz um, uh, responsiveness is fine and it's been tested with user interfaces where a couple of milliseconds is neither here nor there. Um, we're in uh, microseconds at this um, and um, we actually don't care exclusively about how long an interruption lasts but also things like how many interruptions I get within a defined period of time. We've got a job to do and it's got to be done in a certain time period using as we said earlier an accurate clock. So the, the use case is surprisingly well, A, more complex than it looks like at first glance, but it's also not in line with what you normally use time sharing or hardware. So uh, just to bring this back to Kubernetes specifically, um, 
one of the challenges is, you know, we have affinity and anti-affinity. So a workload can ask for uh, to be on certain kinds of hosts or mm -hmm. not to be with other things. But one challenge with uh, real time, uh, I'll put it with uh, quotation marks, real time, is you want to know what other things are running on that node uh, because they can interrupt you. So there should be ways to request you know, I, I want a node all to myself with these specific things for this network function to run. Please don't run any other network functions on that node. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 I would be clear on the distinction between best effort and guarantee, right? Anti-affinity is best effort. Anti-affinity is saying that I will not run you with something else because that is likely or it may affect your performance but something else may affect your performance as well. You're certainly never gonna be the only process on a whole Linux box. Um, if you're running Kubernetes, that's an impossibility. Um, but a guarantee is a different thing, which is I don't care what else is running on this box because I know that I will get a certain performance level regardless of whatever is running on that box. Um, yeah, but the key to this is where... policies and enforcing those policies somehow. It's a big topic. So, is there, isn't that where the taints and tolerations come in? that you can effectively taint nodes to make them exclusive to your application. And then it's up to you what you run on those particular nodes. Yeah, exactly. I, I think we have a whole bunch of different tools here and uh, this use case is perfect for looking at all of them and trying to find a way to, to streamline them and suggest what the best practices would be. So I, I think this is perfect. Uh, I don't think we have clear answers. There's a lot of aspects here. Yes, we may be trying to solve a very big problem here. It might not be the best one to start with. Um, there may be something we can get out of it, but I think solving the entirety of that problem, at least again, based on past experience with this, is probably um, a very, very hard task. Um, and there are other things we could do first that we would actually get to the end of. Yeah, I, I think a good approach for this would, uh, would be to ask the ORAN people what they do. Um, it, I'd be surprised if they haven't spent time thinking through some of these details and um, considering that they want to sit in that space, uh, they, they certainly have to have some answer. And may, maybe it's in practice, it works well enough. Uh, yes, it could be an issue, but it's, it happens rare enough that we don't have to care about it. Then we move on. Well, that filled up the hour nicely. <laughs> All right. Uh, Taylor, so I added another link coming. in the chat that I hope you could add to the discussion too. Um, oh. Um, Advanced cluster management or, or ACM does uh, um, uses policies to kind of decide on placement of uh, where in the cluster your uh, your workloads will sit. So. Um, All right. I'll drop Get it another. in the in the chat here. Can you drop it in the discussion forum? Uh, sure. I I mean I I added one seventy four, and I put a bunch of links, including one to I saw there's a op, a Kubernetes operator for OpenShift. I don't know if there's a, a re repo and if that's available for anyone, but that's that would be interesting as well. All right. Um, well, I guess we'll have to get to these others. Frederick, thanks for adding the regulations. Um, I know where he's going. I put up a slide there. People want to see yeah. what some of the initial things are, and we can talk about it next week as well. Yeah, let's do that. Um, let's see. Deferred. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. Hey, bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.